Good morning. I think we're live. Here comes YouTube. Here comes Kitty Cat. Tora wants uh, to adventure in the great outdoors. But her boyfriend's out there. I use the term boyfriend lightly. I use gallons of hand lotion. My skin is so dry. That's uh, a drawback here in the mountains. Our humidity is always low. But I use gallons of hand lotion down in Orange County. So eh, not much difference. Anyway. Um, we are live in beautiful downtown Crestline in the San Bernardino Mountains of Southern California's Inland Empire. Poor Oswald, lips more cracked than the surface of Mars. Yeah, my lips tend to start cracking and peeling, but I either use a lip balm or go ahead and smear the hand lotion on them. It helps. Oh, uh, wow. I don't know what it is. I've never been able to drink without getting the corners of my mouth wet. And it bugs me. Even if you can't see it, I can feel it. Oh, well, the title today is Spontaneous. I did look it up, but I forgot again. Because I've always thought of spontaneous as sudden. It isn't. Oh, it's giving me something to buy. i got to do definition. Performed or occurring as a result of a sudden inner impulse or inclination and without premeditation or external stimulus. Yes, it starts suddenly, doesn't necessarily finish suddenly, but it appears to be without cause. Like my skin cancer, which used to extend from here all the way to here is now a tiny little bump up here. They will call it spontaneous remission, but I know what happened. I noticed infection, pus oozing out of the cancer, and I decided that I would try topical antibiotics to reduce the infection. Well, the usual suspects didn't work. The various, uh, well, like dopping it with the cotton ball soaked in household hydrogen peroxide. I even dobbed it with rubbing out uh, a cotton ball soaked in rubbing alcohol. I tried the various creams that are antibiotic. And then I tried tincture of iodine. The little glass bottle with the glass rod inside the lid and you, yeah. It kind of seemed to work, but it stings a lot because the tincture of iodine is dissolved in alcohol. I had the same problem with rubbing alcohol aside from no real results on the infection. But the iodine seemed to be working, so I got a bottle of what we call betadine. The label on my generic brand bottles just says iodine, but it's dissolved in water, not alcohol. 
And every day I daubed a little iodine on the uh, basal cell carcinoma. I had three biopsies and apparently that's how it got infected. There was an open wound to get infected. Or maybe my immune system just realized, hey, this isn't right. In any case, it began to crumble and fall off my face. So I just kind of rub it. And it turned into something like a fine gravel that I could just wipe off with a damp wash rag. I'm still working on the last little dot here, but it used to cover half my lip and go up to here. You see, I kept delaying the surgery to remove it because they wanted to take off half my nose to make sure they got all of the cancer. Well, now I don't have to do that. If this little bump right here will just go away, it's taken several years. It, it isn't a sudden healing, but whatever it is, I'll take it. So, yeah, it's spontaneous remission in the sense that it appears to be without a cause, but it didn't happen suddenly. I suppose it might have begun suddenly when the site of the biopsy got infected. But I'm really interested in the kind of spontaneous. Spontaneous. I forgot the word. Oh, dear. Oh. Here we go. I got my brain just fired another neuron. Spontaneous human combustion. I think I've stumbled upon a possible cause for at least some cases of spontaneous human combustion. where a human being suddenly catches fire and burns from the inside out. And it's usually just the torso that burns, not the arms, not the head, not the legs, just the torso, usually. And the legs and feet are almost never burned especially from the knee down. And although in most cases people were found like that, some cases had witnesses who saw it happen. A person might be sitting in a chair watching television or walking outside in a thunderstorm. Now, a lightning strike would not cause what we call spontaneous human combustion, suddenly and apparently without cause. However, there are other things to consider. And I was watching YouTube as usual. And there was a short clip about ozone, not smog, but the O3, pure oxygen, but in a radical state. It has three atoms in the molecule, whereas normal oxygen has two. So you got O3 and O2. We uh, commonly breathe in O2 all the time. The ozone layer, the real ozone layer of our planet, the good ozone layer, is made primarily of O3, where 
cosmic radiation or, or the solar wind has hit oxygen molecules and turned them into O3, which is very chemically reactive. We know that oxygen is needed for a fire to burn. But there has to be a spark. It doesn't start the fire. Thank God, because uh, we breathe it in all the time in our lungs. But <coughs> ozone is a different puppy entirely. It can ignite a fire when it touches a flammable object. Okay, hi Oswald, hi Jan. Uh, let's see. I'll type in the uh, little box here. Okay. I didn't call you Jam for a minute. I thought I hit the M instead of the N. Okay. So, we've got O3, ozone, the real ozone, not smog, can ignite a fire when it touches something flammable. Hmm. Don't worry, I don't so much smoke as burn cigarettes. Mom always complained when I smoked, not because I was smoking, but because I was doing it wrong. I don't inhale right down into my lungs. Eesh. I just puff on them, which is bad enough. They are toxic. Anyway, oh, hi, Sandra. We missed half the lecture on ozone, O3, a very reactive oxygen molecule that is formed way up in our Earth's atmosphere. It's also formed in lightning strikes. It's also formed when electrical circuits short out So you're sitting there watching TV, minding your own business, and all of a sudden there's a power surge or, or your TV goes on the fritz, it goes poof, big old sparks flying everywhere from a short circuit. That makes ozone. Lightning strikes. That's why the air smells so different during a thunderstorm. If you're near the lightning strike, it makes ozone. Now imagine breathing in a large amount of ozone. Ozone, O3, oxygen molecules, can ignite a fire. And you just breathed it in, a big, huge, heavy dose of it. Poof! Your lungs are instantly fried. You're doomed. And you're going to die. And people are going to find your torso in ashes. But usually your arms, your head, and your legs untouched. That is one possible cause for spontaneous human combustion. There are cases where it would not fit, but there are plenty of cases where it would fit. Some guy's walking in a rainstorm and all of a sudden he's burning in the middle of a rainstorm and his whole torso burns and no one can put out the fire. Or a woman is sitting in a chair watching television and suddenly her family sees her whole torso burning and they can't out the fire. 
That sounds like ozone to me. I wonder if any of these so-called experts have ever investigated that possibility. I'd hate to see them try it on lab rats. That would be so cruel. They could make a model of lungs and try it on the model, you know, made without living things. Anyway, that's my thoughts on spontaneous, plus the spontaneous remission of my basal cell carcinoma, cancer. It went from here to here, and now it's just a little dot here. And what did it for me was every day dopping a little iodine on it. The tincture dissolved in alcohol was stinging too much. And you get a little tiny bottle. So I got a fairly good sized bottle. About six ounces, I think, of iodine. The name brand is Betadine, but I got the generic brand. It's dissolved in water. doesn't sting nearly as much. Iodine by itself is a little bit stingy, but not like the tincture with the alcohol in it. It's like the stuff they paint uh, around a surgical site before they operate on you. Before they make an incision, they paint the site with iodine, and they usually have the name brand, Betadine. Uh, B as in boy, E-T-A. I think it's D-I-N-E. Yeah. Anyway, that's my cancer story. I didn't have to have surgery where they take off half my nose and a good chunk of my lip and cheek because it's going away. And I think the iodine is simply helping my immune system to recognize it and send in the soldiers. It all started when my third biopsy got infected and I was treating the infection. Little did I know that it would make the cancer go away. Love it. Now, even weirder, I don't know what I'm doing Maybe it was that Pfizer COVID shot. I took the first one, but I had such a terrible allergic reaction that I couldn't take the second one. I was miserable for a week with painful itching and burning on both arms from elbow to shoulder and across my shoulders and up the back of my neck. And eventually... I developed a red rash all over my chest and arms. I couldn't look at the back of my neck. I've tried that mirror thing where you stand in front of a mirror, use a handheld. It doesn't work for me. I can't see it. So anyway, hi, Buckeye. But maybe... Because of the nature of that vaccine, which is not a vaccine at all, it's mRNA. I know what that is. I studied pre-med for crying out loud. But I tell you, I'm, I'm almost 67. And it's been at least 10 years since I grew body hair. You know, legs and underarms. Yeah, I figured it was the change of life, menopause, and it just meant I didn't have to shave. Well, the other day, my underarms were itching like crazy. So I went to just wipe them down with a cold, wet wash rag, and I looked, and I felt 
I have hair in my underarms. First time in 10 years. Maybe it's because of that vaccine, uh, that Pfizer shot. Maybe it's because of changes I've made in my diet and lifestyle. I don't know. But on the one hand, it, it's a sign that I'm a little more youthful. But on the other hand, I'm going to have to shave. I don't even have a razor. I haven't needed one. And there are other signs you might have noticed that my hair isn't as gray as before. Well, it is in the back, but I don't see that, so who cares? But it's turning more brown. It looks more brown in person than on the screen, but there's still gray in it, but more brown hair now. So stay tuned for further updates. Um, let's see. How do you do that? Like this. If you don't know how to do a heart, it's this thing. And without a space, the number three. When you put a space in, you get to see the letters. Um, I wonder if this one works. Nope. It's supposed to be like, whoa, or maybe a big grin. Well, anyway. When I was talking about the New World Order and all that stuff a couple weeks ago, either Verizon or YouTube, most likely YouTube, decided that I didn't deserve to be on the Internet. So I guess we are not allowed to talk about the wealthy and powerful elite who really run things or think they do. And consider us their property. But I came across a tidbit I didn't either didn't remember or never knew that um, Latin phrase on our on the back of a dollar bill, Novus Ordo Seclorum, New World Order, or New Order of the Ages. I, I always knew it was Latin. It was from Virgil, the poet Virgil. So I'll probably delve into that in my spare time, if I have any spare time. Virgil wrote the Aeneid, which was to justify the Carthaginian Wars also known as the Punic Wars, from which we get our word punishment. But Punic meant of the Carthaginians. Yeah, in, in, the, in the story of the Aeneid, Aeneas, a prince of Troy, has a torrid love affair with Dido, or Dido, the queen of Carthage, but then he abandons her and goes to Rome and founds a great republic. The city of Rome is already there. It has a king. And if I remember correctly, Aeneas marries the king's daughter, but he marries some Roman woman and ends up basically being king of Rome. Well, so the Carthaginians are really ticked off because poor Dido, being lovesick, throws herself off the walls of her castle and dies. 
suicide. So they attack Rome. And they have many naval battles. Now, Carthage was good at seafaring and Rome really not. Rome didn't have much of a navy. But these skirmishes at sea were nothing compared to when Hannibal, a prince of Carthage, attacked Rome by land. You've probably heard all about how he crossed the Alps with elephants. Many of the elephants died, but they didn't all die, and the Roman legions were terrified of the elephants. See you later, Buckeye. Thanks for coming to me. Bye. Can't. Uh, thanks for stopping in at Buckeye. Stoping? The word is stopping. I don't know why I wrote can. I was trying to write thanks. Maybe it's the automatic spell checker. I don't know. Anyway, I think it's the one in my head, not the one on the computer. Yeah, I know all about sending documents in, Buckeye. They always want all the pages of my bank statements. So, of course, the page, there's four pages and only the first page is relevant. But they just have to see all four. And I don't get them in the mail. They're on the Internet. I'm almost out of printer ink and I'm running low on paper and these bozos want me to print stuff for them they won't let me just blend out the email it to them i hear a noise that needs checking hi cora did you need to go out can i open the door Shall I? It's fine. It's the neighbors, not my yard. Okay, put that down. I said Torrin's boyfriend. He, uh, this old Tom cat apparently, where, but I don't think they feed him very well. He won't come in, and I, that's fine with me. I, I have two cats. I don't need another one. But when my cats are through with their breakfast, I let him eat what's left. And sometimes it's quite bountiful because my cats are spoiled. Hand lotion. Getting dry skin all over me. It's like dandruff, but it's on my arms. So anyway, Virgil wrote all about Aeneas and Dido and all that. And yeah, on the one hand, it's fiction. But on the other hand, I'll bet there's truth in it. Hannibal was finally defeated. I forget the name of the Roman general. Oh, it might have been Scipio. Africanus. Yeah, that sounds right. And after that, the Roman legions went to Carthage and not only killed each other, but also leveled all the buildings. Carthage never recovered. And that's North Africa, um, near the Straits of Gibraltar. 
I suppose it's Morocco today, but I'm not sure. Okay, where is Carthage today? Tunisia. Okay, that's right next to Morocco. Ah, oh, I have gardening to do. The weeds are very happy. My uh, lilac bushes have buds, finally. Usually by this time of year, they're covered in huge open blooms. These uh, big kind of cone-shaped, long, skinny clusters of lavender-colored flowers or lilac-covered flowers. St. Google, yeah. Well, there are other search engines, but my philosophy is they're always watching me. They're always listening to me. So I'll proceed based upon that premise. Keeps me out of trouble. Oh, God. Foucault. The hero. Foucault's pendulum and all that. I wish that. I, I hope that's. hope that isn't true. Horrible. Jan has a Zoom meeting. Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. I have a Zoom meeting on Wednesdays. I kind of like Zoom and kind of don't like it. It's really picky about logging into a, to it and joining a meeting. Let's see. I'm trying to type. I can't stay as long as usual anyway. Anyway, that little tidbit about Virgil writing Novus Ordo Seclorum and being quoted on the back of our dollar bill came from a YouTube, of course, of uh, Professor N. T. Wright, Wright with a W, an Anglican bishop and and a professor at the is it called? No, it's got to be university. Whatever, Saint Andrew in Scotland, and an author of many books. He gave the Gifford lectures I think three years ago at the University of Edinburgh I know Americans tend to say Edinburgh but it's a shortened form of borough and the Scottish people say Edinburgh almost a bur uh like borough anyway also in Scotland a series of eight lectures on natural theology. And I get the impression that Wright doesn't see eye to eye with the frame, theoretical framework of natural theology. He's more into looking at history to learn about God or, or religions. Or theology. Natural theology is the idea that you can look at the world around you, the world of nature, and deduce that God exists and that God created it. Do I think that conservative theologians and the green anarcho-primitivists will ever unite in their hatred of the Enlightenment? I think they're the greenies, at least, are a product of the Enlightenment. 
And there's quite a bit of uh, debate as to whether the Enlightenment ever existed. It was kind of tacked on to uh, the era from the 1700s into the late 1800s by historians, but the people of that time did not call it the Enlightenment. They did kind of focus on light. What I remember from uh, my college class in world history is that the buildings let in more sunlight. Public buildings had more, bigger windows and people's homes actually had windows. The art of glasswork was so improved and, and the um, ability to make ordinary people's houses out of timber instead of mud <laughs> um, kind of made it possible to have windows and more of them. It also resulted both in England and over here. I really don't know much about the rest of Europe, let alone the rest of the world. But at least on our eastern seaboard and in England, houses ended up very skinny, very skinny and tall, and they'd be two or three stories high because there wasn't a whole lot of space Space to build homes in the city. You th think of the brownstones in cities like New York and Boston. Uh, if you ever watched All in the Family with Archie Bunker, the houses on his street are like that. They actually share common walls. There isn't even a space between homes. Anyway, that's what I remember uh, about the Enlightenment was that both public and private buildings let in more sunlight. But as to the rise of science and which actually began with at least as far back as Copernicus with a, a nice exclamation point for Galileo, 1600s. All of a sudden, we rose out of the dark ages and became these enlightened scientific people, horse pucky. What happened was that Somebody discovered the poetry that, well, it's poetry, but it's essays by Lucretius. De Regum, De Regum, and translated it on the nature of things. I'm typing De Regum Natura. And Lucretius was kind of a Gnostic. He, he was the source for many Gnostic theologies. I'm going to get Lucretius's dates because I don't remember. You see, when I write a book, I'm writing things down so I don't have to remember them. Okay, he was born 94 BC in Pompeii. That's that coastal town in Italy that got buried by a volcano. Anyway, Lucretius was inspired by Democritus. the theory of atoms. And, 
Okay. Who translated me? Um, oh gosh. What's his name? <laughs> um, okay. Lu the Roman poet Lucretius. I think I'm spelling that right, came up with the idea of Clinamon because he read Epicurus, and Epicurus got the idea from Democritus, and Democritus had a teacher, but I, I don't remember his name. Anyway, Lucretius championed the idea that the universe was formed when utter chaos or perfect order, take, take your pick, they're the same thing, everything's the same, was disrupted by one little atom that veered off course and touched another atom. And from that we get, of course, evolution. Evolution of the universe with all the stars and planets and galaxies and Asteroids and comets. Uh, Crispin, I think you're right. Um, I think it was Lucippus who taught Democritus. Anyway... So the whole universe evolved through, through pure random chance when one little atom veered off course and made something different from everything else. So the universe was basically either a sheet of white typing paper or a sheet of black construction paper. Take your pick. There was nothing to observe and nobody to observe it. Well, now, uh, Charles Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, first posed the theory of the evolution of life on Earth. He had no evidence. So Charles Darwin didn't exactly come up with the theory of evolution. And Wallace, a contemporary of Darwin, came up with it at the same time. He was uh, actually first before Darwin. But Darwin had connections in the Royal Society. And he, Wallace, I think he was observing butterflies. And of course, Charles Darwin was observing little black birds. Darn if I can remember which kind of birds. They were like crows or ravens or... Ah. Anyway, they decided this was evidence for evolution, but Wallace was puzzled as to how... He, he really questioned his own theory. And Darwin did as well. Wallace's problem was that if only the fittest survive, that isn't happening. I mean, every population would be de come down to just one, the fittest. You'd have uh, one cat, one dog, one bird. at least only one species of each family of animals. That isn't happening. And what Darwin said was not that the fittest survive, but that the strongest survive. He saw evolution as 
being helped along by warfare between and within species, competition for resources. Either way, we shouldn't have so much abundance and we shouldn't get so upset when the species extinct because that's natural, it's evolution. Of course, it didn't take too long for certain prejudiced, bigoted people to use Darwin's theory to say that people with dark skin were inferior and Jews were inferior. Anyone who disagrees with you is inferior. They aren't the fittest, so they shouldn't survive. And so you have in... In the time of Charles Dickens, let's get his dates. We read Oliver Twist. Okay, he was born in 1812, died in 1870. So he's pretty much the tail end of the Enlightenment. He's writing about these poor, poor Oliver Twist in the workhouse. Please, sir, I want more gruel. And we read that and we feel so sorry for little Oliver Twist and all the other people in the workhouse. But Dickens' readers were laughing. It was hilarious. They agreed with Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. Are there no workhouses? And if, if the poor are going to die for lack of money, let them die. And Make room for, for better people. <laughs> Oswald found a way to write Phil's name without it turning into stars. I love it. Well, anyway, it's okay that Oliver Twist ends up living in the Lord home and being all wealthy and everything, not because he deserves it, but because it turns out that he's actually the Lord's grandson. The Lord had um, disowned Oliver's mother and she died tragically when he was very young. So Oliver Twist ended up in a workhouse. But it's okay for him to have a happy ending because he's really a blue blood, a member of the nobility. When you go to authors like Jack London, in the literary form we call naturalism, it's more obvious. People of lower classes, even if they achieve some success and even a little wealth, they always come to a bad end because they are not the fittest. And the guy who's trying to build a fire in the snow freezes to death. Nobody rescues him and he fails to build a fire because that's just natural. Hence naturalism. And Philip K. Dick didn't see it that way. He wanted to help anyone who is in need. If he could. He didn't want the lower classes to come to a bad end just because their DNA is supposedly uh, not as good as, as the upper classes. Now in America, we don't have dukes and earls and kings and princesses and all that. But we really do. We just don't call them that. My water's almost empty. I'll be right back. Uh, uh. Oh, I said I wasn't going to stay long, but here it is. Here it is. Here I am. Almost fifty. Yeah, 50 minutes, close to an hour.
panpsychism. Well, but hi, Vikan. I was fascinated by the experiments with plants. You know, some guy would go in and beat up a plant while another plant was nearby. And then he'd leave the room. And then other people would come by and they had these uh, basically lie detectors <laughs> hooked up to the plants. Well, of course, the plant that got beat up would show a reaction when the guy who had beat it up came into the room. But the other plant did as well. The plant that just watched. Now, plants don't have eyes, ears, noses. But they communicate somehow. I suppose living things do have something we might call consciousness. I know my cats do. They even have free will. So if you're asking what the image of God is, you can't say free will. Cats have it too. Dogs have it, but dogs have free will, but they're able to suppress it when their human is telling them to sit or stay. You know, the human feeds them and so forth. Cats don't have filters. If I tell Tora no, she goes straight to my favorite chair and starts clawing it. Anyway, yeah, I'm just not into the idea that God is in everything. Because that's Gnostic. Hmm. It went out. <coughs> there. Anyway, I do drink a lot of water. I need a lot of water. Okay, a message is held for review. I don't see anything wrong with it. Maybe slit is a bad word? I don't know. I think the double slit experiment, Howard says, shows we change reality by observation. Well, that goes back to Lucretius et al. The universe did not exist when it was perfectly orderly because it could not be observed. Everything was the same, and there was no one to observe it anyway. Uh, and, uh, um, Oswald, I'm uh, getting papers from academia.edu. They're free. I mean, you can pay and get an upgraded membership, but... I've got lots of academic papers. Now, if you wrote a paper that you want to send me, that's different. But I probably have all the papers I need, and I'm going through them while working on my work in progress. The exegesis. The explanation of the exegesis. Oh, Philip K. Dick. Oh, it's killing me, too. But today I need to pull weeds before they take over the universe. One of the first um, interviews that I witnessed was when Phil was on the radio. I'm blanking on the name. It was in 
it, it was in Los Angeles. Anyway, um, he said, and he repeated it in his speech at, at a science fiction convention. Cra the crabgrass and the telephone company are taking over the universe. Well, we didn't have internet, but internet is basically the telephone company. Look who provides internet and cable television. Oh, okay, Oswald. One more paper won't hurt me. Uh, here's my email. Titties. Cat seven 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 at gmail dot com. And by the way, a couple of my listeners have sent me small gifts, like twenty five dollars, and I really appreciate it. Oh, lies Inc. That's an alternate title of one of Phil's books. Forgive me for forgetting which one. Okay, let me see. L I E S. Good old Google is my friend. Ah, the unteleported man. Yeah, the unteleported man had to fit as half of an ace double. He expanded it to um, make lies incorporated. Basically, uh, he was looking at the Irish immigration to the United States. They had a terrible famine, the potato famine. And thousands and thousands of Irish were told, okay, you can get on the boat. We'll take you to the United States for free. But when you get there, you'll be a slave. Ralph Winter. Okay, I got to type. Hi, Crispin. Hi, Ralph. So, uh, the unteleported man is about this, you know, things are really bad on the Earth, but there's this planet orbiting Proxima. Which, by the way, astronomers think that there might be a habitable planet orbiting Proxima Centauri. Um, and like the, this corporation is offering to take you by kind of a Star Trek teleporter to the wonderful colony on Proxima, but when people get there, they find out that they're slaves. Good afternoon, Ralph. It's still morning here. Okay, if I'm going to stay on any longer, I have to recycle some coffee. It'll only take a minute, but I'll be right back. Let me type that.
okay, I'm coming. Ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. I'm back. Or as they say in the horror movie, they're back. Oh, uh, Lord. I really was going to go out and pull weeds. The thing is, I've tried getting down on my knees to pull weeds, and my hip hasn't healed that well just yet, so it, it doesn't like it, and it lets me know. So I got a little stool to sit on, but even five minutes of pulling weeds, and I have to take a break. So I've got some of the tools, garden tools, where you stand up and either hack it or twist it. I've got a couple different things, and they get the weeds started, but I still have to bend down and pull them out. I'm very soon, I'm going to have to resort to a weed whacker. The thing is, they, the weeds come back really fast when they're just whacked and, and you don't pull out their roots. So I guess Crabgrass Telephone Company are taking over the universe. Okay. Um... Wow, I need to sort through all my books again. Last year, I had them sorted out, books to keep, books to sell, books to donate, books that were given to me by the authors, whether they were signed or not. Um... They're all mixed again. When I don't, when my book is not in the bookshelf, it's because it does not belong in the bookshelf. It belongs in the box or bag where I put it, or it belongs sitting on top of my desk. Not put into some random empty spot in a bookshelf. <sighs> yes, I'm ornery. Also, I had some put aside for a little free library. You just put up a, you know, place out front where people can walk up to it and take a book, leave a book. No late fees at a little free library. Can't find them now. How many books do I have? Well, I was down to 2,000, but I think I'm back up to 3,000 books. I can't resist a good yard sale. And... I love books, and I prefer to read them on paper. The uh, electronic books really strain my eyes. Plus, I can take a pencil and write little notes in the book, and I know that can be done on a Kindle, but I'm not that tech savvy. And besides, computerized devices tend to do anything but what I tell them to do. Even when I'm just playing solitaire, you know, I'll touch the card I want to move, nothing happens. But when I pull my hand away, it just kind of wafts over some other card. And that one plays when I did not want it to. Anyway, I love books. 
And of course, I have some of Bill's books. They only found some of those and shoved them into bookcases instead of minding their own business. I had them out because I was referring to them, reading them for quotes and context in the book I'm writing. They did not belong in the bookcase because they had to go back into the box of my very special collection of Philip K. Dick's books. Ah, Crispin is learning to read Phil in English. Delo, I keep forgetting whether that's Portuguese. Crispin Delo. I can read French with a dictionary. I was reading Les Aventures de Dernier à Panserage, uh, the last Moorish ruler or conqueror in Spain. But, you know, life got in the way and I haven't had time to finish it. But I have to have the French-English dictionary right beside me to look up words that I don't know. And I've lost most of my German vocabulary, so even though I was once fluent and able to just read it, now I need the Lemonscheid's Dictionary. Ah, I think I've forgotten more than many people ever know. You posted an amazing PKD book that you think I've never heard of? Oswald, well, uh, what is the title of it? Is it by Phil or about him? I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to take another quick break. It'll just be a couple minutes. My gut's me. Saying hip, but it's really the top of my femur, the big leg bone that goes from the knee to the hip. That's killing me. It's been eight months. Uh, uh, okay, I guess I have to open Facebook and see what Oswald posted. He wrote many books that never got published. Okay, let's see.
uh, looking for your uh, profile. I see a YouTube video from the 1st of April. That's, uh, by the way, April Fool's Day. I don't see it. And we're friends. Maybe it was a photo. Nope. Well, Oswald, it ain't showing up. Unless it's the prehistoric nice guy. But that's from April 1st. This is from August. That's from August. I'm not seeing it. You must be in a group. Oh, the PKD fan group. Huh. Yeah, they got mummies. Um, PKD fan group. <laughs> well, uh, the Mars thing. I'm not going to read that aloud because uh, it has bad words. And YouTube doesn't like bad words. Anyway, uh, 22 mummies, Ralph. Uh, I kind of, I got a link to the story. Evil phone. I got a link to the story about the mummies, but I didn't click on it. I have to save my good internet connection for these little talks, these conversations. Huh, why am I tired? It's morning. I should be waking up, not dozing off. Well, anyway... I didn't eat anything. I, I usually um, munch on crackers with cheese and crackers with peanut butter before I come on live on YouTube. Didn't do that today. Ah, wow. Oh, sheesh. I think maybe I should have eaten my crackers before I opened YouTube. Got a cigarette out, but I don't want it, so I won't light it. I'm, I'm just really, I think I'm on to something about spontaneous human combustion. Especially if you're out in a thunderstorm and lightning strikes near you but doesn't hit you, or maybe it does, but the main thing is that it creates ozone, O3, a very reactive form of oxygen. You breathe in a large amount of it, and poof, your lungs are incinerated. Thank God, regular oxygen O2 doesn't do that. But I'll bet that's one of the causes of spontaneous human combustion. I'm not sure I like having the, the desk here where I moved it when it comes to videos. Maybe if I put up the curtain that, that Tora tore down. Don't you just love cats? If I put up the curtains again, don't know how long they'll stay. Oh, wow. 
See you, Crispin. I got to go to. So. Um, uh, I'm going to get going and pull. Well, first I'll eat something and then I'll pull weeds and and stuff like that oh and i have some laundry to hang out on the line i don't have a clothes dryer and i like the clothes line better anyway mm. well, uh, okay there Hi, uh, glad you all came by, and it's been great to have a conversation. Maybe someday I'll have the bucks to set up a show where you can call in and talk. But for now, the chat room is really great. You guys are intelligent and, and informed. And... and I always enjoy talking to you, which is why I stayed on much longer than I had planned. I guess the weeds will still be there tomorrow, right? See ya.